Go Inside the Crimson Tide with your hosts, Rodney Orr and Gary Harris, keeping you informed on everything Alabama. Tighter Insider TV, brought to you by Visit Tuscaloosa. And hello again, everybody, alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com. I'm WVUA 23 Sports Director Gary Harris. This is Tider Insider TV, or as the late great Mal Moore used to say, Tider Insider. <laughs> Pretty much the way he said it. Perfectly. I used to love to hear him say that, Tider Insider. Tider Insider TV is in its 25th season covering Alabama, and uh, this episode is brought to you, as always, by Visit Tuscaloosa. For more information on a great, great organization that helps commerce and Tourism in our area, visit Tuscaloosa.com. All right, Rod, one game in, and I tell you what, it's hard to imagine that it could have started much more impressively. Let's get to the video. The Kalen DeBoer era is officially underway as Alabama's head coach, and he claimed his first win in front of a sold-out stadium at Bryant-Denny on Saturday night. 63 to nothing over Western Kentucky. There was rain that afternoon, but it was out of there by game time. The Crimson Tide dominated this game. Well, this is some great video that... Our Charlie Abernathy got just kind of the, the color and the pageantry of the game. And then when the game started, uh, Alabama's defense was in playmaking mode. I mean, they were aggressive. They were athletic. They ran to the ball. They got interceptions. They sacked the quarterback. And then on offense, big plays. They ran 20 plays in the first half, 20 plays for nearly 360 total yards of offense. It was 42 to nothing at the break. For the game, Alabama racked up 600 yards of total offense, including 334 on the ground to just 260, it's 266 through the air to just 145 total yards for Western Kentucky. So it was domination in every way. Uh, defensive back Keon Sab. Immediately a star. Hey, Caleb Downs is gone. He's great. Keon Sav's pretty good replacement, right? Two interceptions, SEC Defensive Player of the Week. Ryan Williams, two catches. He made them count. 139 yards and two touchdowns in those two plays. Uh, the 63-point victory for DeBoer is the largest margin of victory in a head coaching debut in Alabama program history. And, Ronnie, the good news is there were some mistakes. There's still some coaching up to do. There's still a high ceiling for this team, but I can't think of a much better way to get it started. No, I thought it was a really good start all around. You know, you kind of summarize the whole thing, but I'll say this. You look at that defense, I, I, I thought there was a lot of questions going in in terms of not necessarily doubts, but just what is it going to look like? We're, we're so used to seeing Nick Saban for 17 years. It's a little bit different. We talked about that last week. We saw a lot more players. You remember when Sammy called mm -hmm. in last week? We said, hey, Sammy, we expect a lot more guys to play on the defensive side. We saw five cornerbacks, I think, in the first couple of series, which is really good. Three of those were true freshmen. Uh, you had a couple of transfers to Monty Jackson to Sean Jones eventually got in the game as well. So you saw a lot of young players. You saw a, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of passion on both mm -hmm. sides of the ball. That's one thing that we also talked about throughout August, just kind of the intensity, the enthusiasm, and those types of things that we were seeing in camp. They were revealed on the field. Yeah, there was some adversity. Even before the game started, your, your starting left tackle, Caden Proctor, injures his shoulder and is out for the game. So Elijah Pritchett, yeah, he worked there in the spring, but he had worked exclusively at right tackle in fall camp with the Wilkin Formby. He moves over to left tackle. He missed a couple assignments, but I thought all in all he did fine. And I thought the offensive line, uh, I saw some grades that, that somebody listed from PFF on your website. I thought they looked a little low. I thought yeah. that offensive line did a good job. Yeah. And, again, those grades, I'm not really sure how you can grade someone when you don't even really know what the assignment is. But uh, you know what? I, I thought the offensive line for a first game performed really well. I talked to some people, Gary, that played on the offensive line, that started for four years in the SEC. They know what it kind of looks like and said, hey, for a first game, mm -hmm. it's a really good start. You had two new parts really mm -hmm. in there when you're talking about Elijah Pritchett uh, on the left side who had practiced primarily at right tackle. Then you had, you know, obviously – and form me a red shirt freshman. Then you also had Parker Brilsford in you center. So, uh, you know what? For your first game, it really probably had to be a passing grade. All right. Uh, again, and special teams too. I, I, Cole Adams was the main punt returner. Bet he looks comfortable catching the ball. They got him Bakway in there too. He didn't have a chance to return one. Uh, kickoffs were good. Extra points. Field goals were good. Burn up. Average 50 yards punting. Uh, they tackled well on special teams. That's a big part of football, and the special teams looked outstanding. I, I thought they did as well, Gary, and I thought defensively you, you mentioned the tackling. That was one thing we said last few weeks was, you know, we wanted mm -hmm. to really see. In that first game, tackling is usually not yeah. the best. But, I mean, again, they did miss some tackles. There was a couple of third down throws. We saw it. Uh, two or three guys missed, but they got him on the ground eventually. Those are things that they'll continue to work on. But I think as a whole, when you look at it, and, again, a lot of people talking about that defense – 
Uh, I think that it really performed well. I can't tell you how impressed I was. I picked Alabama to give up 20 points. They gave up zero. <laughs> I, now, I had 17. In, in, in the first half, you know, they had, a, I think, Western Kentucky had a 17-yard, 17-play uh, drive, got no points out of it. In the second half, their offense was totally shut down by Alabama's defense. All right, we've had highly uh, anticipated debuts in Alabama football history. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think of a couple right off the top. David Palmer, Julio Jones. Certainly Ryan Williams is in that category, and he did not disappoint. Ryan Williams is the SEC Freshman of the Week after catching two balls, just two, but a touchdown for 85, a touchdown for 54. This is a great wide shot at the 85-yard. Uh, he just leaves the cornerback behind. I don't know what coverage they were in. I would call that coverage where you don't have, uh, don't have a clue coverage. Uh, and, and then the 54-yarder, he shook off two tacklers like they were nothing. 139 yards, two touchdowns. He's the real deal. You know, yeah, he really is. And, and a lot of people, he's only 17 years old. He's supposed to be a senior in high school. To, to be playing on this level, and especially in his first game, and that was another question. A lot of people say, how quickly can Ryan Williams make a contribution? We said it. We figured he would make a really strong contribution very early, and he did. And Keon Sab, we already mentioned him, the transfer safety from Michigan. He played against Alabama in the Rose Bowl. He's the defensive player of the week after those two interceptions in the first half. I thought really were tone setters for the game. Because, you know, early on you're filling each other out. And Western Kentucky and, and, and T.J. Finley, their quarterback, I think thought they could have some success throwing the ball. And Sab said, not on my watch. Well, and, and I think, too, Alabama, I think, had just come off that three and out on that opening possession. I think this was the second defensive possession now here. This is a little bit later here, the second one. But the way he read the ball from mm -hmm. the – basically, it was a center fielder, Gary. And we probably hadn't seen that in a while in terms of the way he broke on the ball, reading it from, from the back end, uh, made a great break on a big-time play. And, Rodney, what I alluded to earlier uh, in regards to 63 to nothing is so impressive. I think it's a, a pretty good team, a team that went to a bowl game and won it last year, picked second in Conference USA in the preseason. But there were enough mistakes, enough sloppiness, that it really gives the coaches, I think, something to work on. Yeah, I, I think when you look at some of the penalties, I mean, obviously the communication continued a little bit. Seth McLaughlin's not here, but they still had some issues with the snap a time or two. I think that's certainly something that you're going to have to work on because you're going to have some road games, obviously, where it's going to be much more difficult. But um, – yeah, I mean, overall, I think that uh, like it was pretty clean, given it was a new staff on both sides mm -hmm. of the ball, uh, a lot of new players. So I thought it went really well. I said this on my 5 o'clock sports. I'll say it again. You can't win them all if you don't win the first one. <laughs> and there, Alabama's one and no. All right, time now for Coach Talk. And this is going to speak to what Rodney was just talking about with, you know, working on some things. Alabama did not give up a single point on defense. I, I, I would say that's pretty good. But for Kane Womack, the first-year defensive coordinator, former head coach at South Alabama, yes, he was impressed, but at the same time, he was not satisfied with his defensive performance. The two takeaways early were positive, but I did not think we capitalized on takeaways as a defense. Um, I thought um, we had opportunities to score on defense multiple times, and we did not make the most of those opportunities. We also had opportunities in the backfield. You know, sacks are great, um, but but sack cause fumbles are, are, are way better, right, to get the ball back for our offense right there on the spot. Um, so those are things that the guys have really been challenged. I did not think we met the standard of what we're we're capable of as a defense there and so I hope to see a response in our players all right uh, again that's what a good defense coordinator does he sees we see all the positives the the, the takeaways the sacks the put the, the tackles for loss, he sees things that they can get do yeah, better. Missed a few opportunities. Yeah. I think they he had wanted more turnovers. Yeah, and they had an opportunity. I mean, Deontay Lawson, again, not pinpointing him, had a really good game, but he had a couple that he probably dropped, one for sure that would have been a walk-in pick six. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have those opportunities. But, uh, it, again, I, and I understand what Kane Womack's saying, but – and he has to nitpick, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you want to make those plays. Yeah, but a good start. All right, Ronnie, this is something some people may have seen. If not, if you've seen it – Get ready to, to tear up again. If you haven't seen it, you're going to love it. This past Friday morning walkthrough for Alabama um, was something special, and, I, and they're going to do this regularly. Coach DeBoer introduced 10-year-old Susanna Ernest to the team. Susanna was diagnosed with a rare health condition in 2022, and she also faces a condition that impacts her heart. The Crimson Tide invited her to score a touchdown against the Alabama number one defense. Now, her favorite position is running back. 
So she got to play running back. Her favorite player is Jalen Milrow, so he handed off to her, Rod. That was great. And then after she received the ball, she was escorted by the offense all the way down for a, 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 a touchdown. So Alabama defense actually did give up a touchdown. And they blocked well for yeah. her, didn't they? The team celebrated and jumped with Susanna, and she led them uh, in, a, in a cheer there at the end. If that doesn't you know, pull at your heartstrings, I don't know what does. Roll tide on that one. Well, still to come on Tider Insider Television, South Florida head coach Alex Golish. Uh, Talking tough back in the in the summer ahead of this season in regards to the week two matchup with the Crimson Tide. You'll hear what he said. And also, we'll be getting to our uh, score predictions a little bit later on, and we'll break down the South Florida Bulls. In our next segment, we'll get to know the opponent. South Florida's coming in here confident. Why not? They took Alabama down to the wire last year in Tampa. And as I said, a little bit later on, we're going to be getting your phone calls, emails, and tweets. 205-348-WVOA. That's the number, 348-9882. Go ahead and give us a call, or you can email us at the address on your screen. We'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide, our 25th season covering Alabama football. Tider Insider TV will return after this. Yeah, Bama and Miami got to play South Florida. So I think it's absolutely imperative for us to, to play the best teams we possibly can. I think going to Alabama is absolutely huge for us. They came to our place. We had every opportunity to go be successful in that game, couldn't finish it. Now we get to go redeem ourselves. I think that's what college football is, man. Like, to me, you don't want to go play in Tuscaloosa. You don't want to host Miami at home. Like... I think it's awesome. And welcome back to TITV, brought to you by Visit Tuscaloosa. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. That's Alex Gullish. Listen, man, I, I, I got no really no problem with that. That was back at uh, their conference media days uh, back in the late summer. They did give Alabama a game last year. Uh, they should be excited about coming here. I, I You know, I, I think that's probably his attitude. Now, I think they're going to be in for a rude awakening. More on that when we give our score predictions. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I got no issue with him, you know, saying, hey, we're I, looking I forward to going there and said, redeeming yeah, ourselves. Yeah, you know? I mean, certainly. You have to be confident, right? Mm -hmm, I that's mean, right. You know, so. Here's the thing. I think Alabama's looking forward to redeeming themselves. That's right. Even though they won the game. Uh, the Tide will host the South Florida Bulls this Saturday night. At uh, 6 p.m. on the soon-to-be Saban Field at Bryant Denny Stadium, there's the head coach uh, from a year ago down in Tampa. The Tide did win the game 17 to three, but it was ugly, man. I mean, this was the only points for South Florida. It was career-long field goal by that kicker, but on the ensuing kickoff, they had a kickoff return called back because of a penalty. Could never get going. Remember, Milrow didn't play, and um, it wound up coming down to Ty Simpson kind of coming in late and, and, and pulling the game out. But they did win it 17-3, to Rodney. But still, it was one of those games Tyler Buckner got the start. Uh, the only start that he made, there was, a, there was a monsoon during the game. But they got out of there with a win. And really, this was the turning point of the season. Yeah, you know, you talk about that the week before they had lost to Texas. They go on the road here in a game that a lot of people said, well, they're going to blow them out. They didn't play well. They had the quarterback issue. Mill Rose, you mentioned, didn't play. Tyler Buckner got his first start. He'd only been with the program for about three months. I mean, it just didn't go well. Just did not click. It, it, was, it was a pretty miserable game to watch, actually. Uh, but Alabama did win. And, and like you said, it, it got them to where they needed to be the next week against Ole Miss, which mm -hmm. was a huge win. You know, Ole Miss was coming in here thinking this is our chance we're going to finally beat Alabama Kiffin thought he was going to beat Saban right didn't happen from there on Alabama played probably as well as anybody in the country yeah. till the end of the year Bulls have nine starters returning on offense eight on defense both their specialists they're an experienced team as we said that will be confident coming in here based on how they played Alabama last year and they should be I think they've got a really good defense uh, they played really well I you know, Gary, including this game and going back to last year, I don't think their defense has given up a touchdown in nine quarters. Uh, they feel really good about their defense. They feel great about their quarterback, Byron uh, Brown. He's an outstanding player. He's really versatile. He's a little bit like Milrow. He can move extremely well, throws the ball well. They've got some receivers, mm -hmm. good running game. Golish is a great offensive coach. So, uh, you know, they – you understand why that they have a little bit of confidence because they did play well last year against Alabama. Well, Ryan Fowler from Tide 100.9, uh, where I do my radio show, and I had an opportunity to visit with Coach Saban in the press box before the game, and he was in a great mood. But if he was in a good mood this past Saturday night, imagine what kind of mood he's going to be in this coming Saturday <laughs> night. Saban Field at Bryant-Denny Stadium is going to be dedicated. Listen, man, the Sabans are, are so thrilled with this. I know there's been some discussion about why is in his name on the stadium. I've got – I think this is good. I mean, you've got – 
Paul Bryant and, and George Denny, two iconic figures in Alabama history, and now you've got a third. I think Saban Field at Bryant-Denny Stadium rolls off the tongue, and I hear people say, well, they won't refer to it as Saban Field. I think people will, and I think that uh, if he and his family are happy with it and about it, I'm happy about it. No, I think so. I think, you know, when you're talking about who, how they will refer to it, I fully expect on these broadcasts that telecasts that they'll say, hey, we're at Saban Field at Bryant-Denny Stadium. There's no doubt about that. And some people may even shorten it and call it Saban Field. You know, you'd hope that they would call it the entire name. But, uh, yeah, certainly I don't, I don't think it's anything uh, that uh, – I don't think Nick Saban's being shortchanged, and I don't think he feels that either. Yeah, funny moment from our conversation with Coach in the press box. I said, man, you hustled to get back. He said, hey, man, I don't, we don't stay for the game. Yeah. He said, I was back at 1.30. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Closer. And so looking forward to Saturday night. Quickly, uh, we're going to mention Alabama soccer went 2-0 and last week. They're really, really good. They won a pair of home matchups against Florida Atlantic and Southern Miss. Alabama – Cruise to a victory over Southern Miss, four to nothing. They also cruised to an eight to two win over Florida Atlantic. So Alabama's on a roll. They're five and one on the season, and they travel to face Purdue on the road this Thursday night. Well, still to come on TITV, Alabama volleyball opened the season with a trio of games in Foster Auditorium. We got more on that coming up. But up next, we're welcoming your phone calls, your emails, and your tweets. Tighter Insider Nation, this is your opportunity to get through on uh, the phones with us. They're open right now. Phone lines 205-348-9882. We want to hear from you when TITV continues. Alabama Volleyball opening the season with the Crimson Tide Invitational inside Foster Auditorium. Great opening weekend. They beat Grambling State, Citadel, and UT Martin to go 3-0 on the weekend. They're back in action this weekend down in Montgomery at the ASU Collegiate Cup. So Alabama soccer and volleyball off to fast starts this season. And welcome back into TITV. We're off to fast start tonight. The show has been rocking and rolling. Let's keep it going with our phone calls. Leading us off tonight is our pal Sammy up in Walker County. Hey, Sammy. Hey, Gary, it's Rodney. Uh, hey, I, I thought this, believe it or not, I believe the defense played great. They really did. The offense was super great. But uh, I was going to comment on that Ryan Williams. That second touchdown, people wonder why they go after that elite five-star talent. He showed it on that move. When he caught the ball, he planted that foot, and he made that move. That's the elite talent. That's why you recruit those kind of guys. You know, Sammy, I think you're right, obviously. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been asking, who does he remind you of? They always want comparisons. You know, I thought watching him in practice a little bit, he, he reminded me quite a bit of Devontae Smith. I think on that play, Gary, the way he – not not this one, but the other one, the second one, when he, when he broke that tackle, reminded me a little bit of Palmer, mm -hmm. that, 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 the way he moved there. So, uh, he's got a little bit of a lot of great ones in him, I think, Sammy. Yeah, thanks for the phone call. We'll, we'll keep this up just so you see it. Well, I was going to see it real quick. Let's just see it real quick. This is what you were talking about. Watch this. One, two, get out of here. He's gone. All right, let's go to Tommy over in Romulus. Hey, Tommy, good evening. Hey, Gary. How are y'all tonight? Doing well. I just want to know how well we came out there without getting hurt and how many quarterback sites did we get this weekend? I haven't heard. You know, uh, Tommy, as far as injuries go, I don't, I don't have a full report, obviously. Outside yet, of Proctor, if you're good. Yeah, Proctor, I haven't really heard anything. You know, and hopefully on Caden Proctor, he won't be out very long. As far as sacks, Gary, I, haven't, I, I, didn't, I don't have the official numbers. I don't know if you have the stats in front of you. I don't, but, but I'll look them up during this break. Obviously, Quandarius Robinson I think it was at least two, Yeah, and I'll, but I'll look them up uh, during the break. All right, so to come on Tider Insider Television tonight, a former Alabama defensive end is continuing his leadership role in the National Football League. And also, more of your phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, the phone number, 205-348-9882. We're going to be right back with more calls and our email question of the day next. Well, earlier today, the Houston Texans announced that former Alabama Outside edge rusher Will Anderson Jr. will be a team captain in just his second season. The reigning defensive rookie of the year joins C.J. Stroud, Larry McTunsell, Jimmy Ward, Aziz Alcherer, Stephon Diggs, and John Weeks as captains. He's a good one. He is a leader, and he is a great player. All right, welcome back in to TITV. And only one sack officially mm -hmm. uh, against uh, Western Kentucky, but a lot of pressures. Yeah, the they affect, we, yeah. yeah, the one we were talking about, yeah. Quindarius Robinson. Yeah. Affected the uh, quarterback, that's for mm -hmm. sure. All right, let's get to our email question of the day. 
And our email question of the day is brought to you by KDM Service Corporation. At KDM Service Corporation, heating and cooling isn't just our job, it's our passion. All right, let's get to it. And it is from uh, Margie and Coleman. What do you think of Coach DeBoer's game day hoodie? Listen, I have been asked about this so much. I'm, I'm going to be nice because I don't think people mean it in a bad way. Uh, I understand there's an expectation of Alabama football coach. Great video that we have up there. I, I think he's got to be who he is. He's got to wear what's comfortable for him. I, I don't have a problem with it. I'm not knocking you if you do. But I'm just saying, I, I think it's fine. I thought it looked great. I mean, you know, again, every, every coach has his own style. I watched him at Washington. He wore similar attire. I don't really get it. I don't know why it really matters, but it does to some. All right, let's get to one phone call before we close it out because Rick and Brent has been patiently holding. we got about a minute, Rick. Okay, why is Coach DeVore didn't have a show to review the game? Or is he going to have one? Yeah, he's got one. He's got one. In fact, you can watch it on Monday nights here on WVUA 23 at 6.30 and at 10.30, Rick. It'll be on 6.30 p.m. on Monday night and at 10.30 p.m. on Monday night. So I don't know where it runs or what time it runs on other stations, but I know we've got it. He records it with Chris Stewart after the game. And then he's also got his radio show, Hey Coach, and the Kalen DeBoer Show on Wednesday nights this week from Baumhauer's Victory Grill in Tuscaloosa. So it's not a lot of difference than it was with Nick Saban. Thanks for the phone calls and emails, and we'll be back to wrap up this edition of TITV with our score predictions next. Stay with us. Time flies when you're having fun. We're about out of time. Score prediction time. Roddy, lead us off. Well, you know, I, I think the Alabama players, a lot of them still remember that chatter last year after that game against South Florida. Uh, I think all those points they didn't score last year, they get them this year with Jalen Milrow, 44-10. Roddy, I'm right there with you. I think the tide is uh, going to roll in this one, too. You know, I picked 52 last week. I like that number. I like 52. I picked it 52-20. Now I've got it 52-13. I hate to say payback when Alabama won the game, but I really do feel like it's payback. I think Alabama is going to take care of business and blow out the South Florida Bulls on Saturday night when we dedicate Saban Field at Bryant-Denny Stadium. All right, that is going to do it for this week's edition of TITV presented by Visit Tuscaloosa. Quick note, uh, Justin Thomas left off the President's Cup team. So is Nick Dunlop. I don't think JT's too upset. He's going to be a father, he announced, coming up in November. That's going to do it for the show. For Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night.